This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm your host, Matt Addison, with Paul Gorst and Theo Squires alongside me as we look ahead to the weekend's fixture away at Brentford and discuss all of the latest Liverpool news, including a double injury blow and four players returning to action. We'll start, though, with a, click, a quick, I should say, glance back to the midweek game Gorsty against Norwich City, where Liverpool cruised through to the fourth round, where they'll meet Preston North End next month. But the main talking point really wasn't the actual result and, and the progression. I think it was probably more so the, the case for the young starlets that they put forward. What did you make of, of Cade Gordon, Connor Bradley and, and Tyler Morton? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is these lads are obviously playing for the short-term future in the Liverpool team, if that makes sense. They know that if, if they get through, then they're going to be looked at for the fourth round and then the fifth round. And so so they know as long as they're still in this competition, they've got a chance of playing first team minutes. So I think that as a motivating factor has got to be quite good, hasn't it, really? Quite um, healthy for, for the team and, and for these types of players. And I thought Gordon had a good game. He was unlucky with one chance, cutting him from the, the, the wide right on his left foot. And... Ruffle the side netting in the first half, his, his touch and his balance and his awareness is um, incredibly high for someone who's not 17 until next month. Um, I think Liverpool have got a real star on the hands here if they can just kind of mould him in the right way. And there's, there's no rush for him to be a, a superstar next month, next year, even in the next two or three years. You know, if you think five years down the line, he's still only 21 years of age. So, um he looks like he's going to be a talent. He's obviously got championship experience with Derby County. Um, so um, I think he's probably the, the the pick of the bunch at the moment is near, you know, around that age range. Um, Tyler Morton, you know what you're going to get with him. Anyone who's seen the academy football, he gets stuck in. He's got a good range of passing on him. And he wasn't overawed in the slightest, was he? Coming in place of Naby Cater and thundered into a couple of challenges and was pointing and directing one or two people to make the run if he was going to make the pass and uh, thought he did well as well um, and obviously Connor Bradley is someone who, um, who will be called upon this season because Liverpool don't have massive strength and depth outside of Trent Alexander-Arnold at right back so good night for all three um, yeah it's just a, it's just a real kind of um, thriving time for the academy isn't it um, Jürgen Klopp's always keen to give them a go and um, they just keep kind of reeling them off off the rack so um yeah, aided and abetted by a few senior players as well with Minamino and Rigi, who, who were kind of in a similar boat, if you like, to to Gordon and the likes, whereas they know that they're probably always going to be starting these Carabao Cup games and FA Cup games. So as long as they can give Klopp something to think about, then it's a job done for them. And, and certainly with the, the three goals between Rigi and Minamino, they've done that. So, yeah, all in all, a really good night for Liverpool um, out in Norfolk. I've seen a few people on social media sort of saying that the fact that Liverpool played these young uh, players in this game, Theo, is a sign of maybe not having the squad depth of, of the other clubs at the top end of the Premier League. But I think for me, that, that misses the point, doesn't it? The whole point of, of these games and, and giving these youngsters the opportunity. Cade Gordon, for example, I'm sure a big part of the reason that he came to Liverpool was because he knows that in these games, they will get chances. Yeah, I don't think that's really a fair comment. You just need to look at the um, the Man City team in midweek where, yes, it was, what, a front five, front six of internationals, but the, the rest of the team were kids. It's like you don't really recognise them and probably that's because we're coming from that Liverpool perspective. But City have been given a few kids ago and you think this is supposed to be the strongest mm-hmm. club in the country, the strongest depth for that squad. And if they're playing still five or six kids there, it shows, well, this is what you want. You don't want Liverpool to be going out and spending 30 million a time on squad players. And that figure is probably going to go up and up just to fill the bench. If the quality is there in the reserve ranks, like if it hadn't been for injuries, you'd have had Harvey Elliott. He's another youngster who he doesn't even feel like a youngster anymore, but he would have been involved at some extent as we carry on. He's having a great season like Curtis Jones. He grabbed his opportunity. Liverpool have got so many talented players there and it shows that the um, the door is open to them to come in and state their claim. Nico Williams, he was another one. He picked up an injury um, so he wasn't able to play, but they've got a lot of players there who are good enough when they're getting the opportunities and whether it means that I, they'll go out on loan at some point and maybe forge a, a good football league career or if they're actually good enough to play for Liverpool, we'll see. But when you're on that initial pathway, the signs are good. And I wonder with Kay Gordon, 
maybe it was with one thought on him that we saw this positional change from Harvey Elliott because he's a bit taller than Elliott, isn't he? He's quicker. He looks more of a winger, whereas Elliott is this playmaker sort of role. And you think, well, this is Liverpool moulding the two of them to be this future down the right-hand side with Trent Alexander-Arnold. This is a, a freight on the right that could be held in those positions down for the next 15 years. And I think that's what any manager wants to see, having that talent in the academy coming through and having the faith in the youngsters that, yes, they can make this impact now. But in a few years, they're going to make those shirts their own and just be a phenomenal talents for the best part of a decade. It's how you build successful teams. I think we saw pre was it uh, end of the transfer window when Klopp was talking about Ronaldo coming to the Premier League. Yeah, great signing for now. Great signing for one season, two seasons. But you've got to think about three, four, five, six. And that's exactly what Liverpool are doing when they blood these youngsters. There was a, a few senior players involved as well, Ghost. You mentioned Takumi Minamino, obviously gets himself on the score sheet a couple of times. He couldn't do a great deal more than that. But do you think that's enough to get him some minutes in maybe some more meaningful games moving forward? It's it's a difficult one, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Um, I mean, Liverpool are blessed with numbers in that area anyway. So you'd imagine at some point across the course of a long, hard season, Minamino might be uh, springing up in a starting place. Here or there, but um, long term, you know, it's difficult, as you say. Liverpool have got four top class options for three positions, and then Origi, who's experiencing a little bit of a renaissance at the moment, and then obviously Minamino, who did really well the other night, two goals to his name, but is still probably a little bit <clears throat> further back from um, from the rest. I'd imagine. I mean, you couldn't imagine Minamino, for example, starting that game against AC Milan, whereas Origi did. And, it was a surprise to everyone, but he certainly contributed to me with that assist for, for Salah. Um, <clears throat> I think Liverpool um, don't really have too many <clears throat> options but to keep Origi and uh, keep Minamino in the, in the fold. Um, obviously, as I said, they've got, what is it, um, the six options for the three places, and um, you don't want to be relying too much on a Mane or a Salah because a hamstring tweak here or there means that Liverpool are without the most obvious goal threats for you know a month, five, six weeks. So um I think I think we will see plenty of rotation in general across across this season. I think Klopp will know where and when to do it. <clears throat> so far he's he's done it superbly well. You know, we think he's made nineteen changes across the last three games. Liverpool have scored three in every one of them. Um so um things are going really well at the moment. And I, and I, you mentioned that about <clears throat> some people moaning that the fact that Kate Gordon was starting and, and Conor Bradley and Tyler Morton's coming on. The, it's kind of indicative of Liverpool's lack of strength and depth. But I think sometimes people just like to have a moan, don't they? People think the, the Liverpool should have two Salas and two Van Dykes in every every position. Look at the team Manchester City fielded on uh, Tuesday night. I mean, I had near of about six of them. Um, and then they, had, they kind of top-loaded it with with big stars. They need to get get the job done. It's just that the way that these, these managers operate and um, it will be a, a staple of the Carabao Cup and, and later in the year, the FA Cup campaigns. Just before we move on then from Norwich, there, I wanted a quick word on Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain as well. I felt that was a, a little bit of a, a missed opportunity for him as one of those senior players. Maybe Minamino took his chance and, and maybe Oxlade-Chamberlain didn't. Yeah, he had a, a poor game, but um, I think it was a few misplaced passes. His touch was a bit heavy. Um, he hasn't really grabbed any opportunities since he's come back in the team. I think it was a similar story, wasn't it, on the opening day of the season? He didn't have the best uh, game there, funnily enough, also against Norwich. And it's one where you're seeing other players come into the team when they're given opportunities, be it a Harvey Elliott before the injury, Minamino in midweek, or Naby Cater in the Premier League. And they're showing a bit more than Oxlade-Chamberlain. I think when Liverpool signed Oxlade-Chamberlain, he showed how good he was as a central midfielder. It was the position he wanted to play and he showed that he could play it really well. But at the moment, when we're seeing him, he looks more effective when he's further forward, when he, if it's out wide or maybe even as that uh, false nine. Uh, technically, I suppose he got the assist for Minamino's uh, second goal in midweek when he was a bit further forward. But then it is hard for a player to find rhythm when they're coming back from injury, when they're not getting consistent game time. Um 
as we've been saying, Liverpool are going to need to rotate. It's a very busy fixture schedule, and they have already lost a couple of midfielders to injury. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to that in a shortly. Uh, there will be opportunities there for Oxley Chamberlain, but when he was this big goal scorer midfielder who could really lead the press and everything, we're just not seeing that from him at the moment. Whether he's trying too hard to impress, like he wants to get on the ball more, he wants to try those fancy passes or the shots from distance to make that impact and it's not working for him. I don't know, but it is one where form can just change in an instant. All it will take for him is to score one good 25-30 yarder or pick out one amazing Hollywood ball to get his confidence going and to really find his rhythm again. Because we know there's a talented player in there. Yeah, he's had his injuries, but he wouldn't be at Liverpool if he wasn't a talented player. And he's such a likeable member of the squad. You're hoping that he can get an opportunity to show what he's about again. And it isn't the end of his Liverpool career and he's meandering out. Cause you think he can still make an impact. He's a versatile player and he is still relatively young. He has got plenty to give if he can get back to his best. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for him over the next few weeks. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of changes to the starting eleven against Brentford as well on Saturday. Jurgen Klopp held his pre-match press conference this morning, nice and early, which is always good for those of us who are reporting on it. But the top line, Gorsty, was probably on Thiago and, and Naby Keita. What's the latest on their injuries? Yeah, a um, bit, bit of a surprise, actually, that those were the first two questions, because I think Klopp spoke to the Bills official website yesterday and Gave a pretty comprehensive um, update on everyone who was injured. Um, so I'd be surprised if anything changed in the, you know, 16 hours since that was published. But um, with Cater, it's um, it's just Groundhog Day, isn't it? I was I was at the game on Tuesday and, and I seen it when he tried to play that through ball with the outside of his foot and kicked the floor. And then I noticed that he was hobbling for a bit and I tweeted it. I said, Cater's hobbling. And then he carried on and played the rest of the half. And I thought, I probably shouldn't have tweeted that because I might be giving people kind of um, a little bit of concern when there doesn't seem to be any. He, you know, we carried on and he's fine. And I've um, <clears throat> got one or two people worried for Navigator's fitness and, and he's okay. And as it turned out, he didn't emerge in the second half. And then Klopp said um, after the game that it's nothing too serious and he's fine. But he did kick the floor and it was a painful one. It's made me think, OK, that, that should be fine by the weekend, and apparently it's not. So, um, I mean, it, 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 I think Keita must be one of these players that, unless they're 100%, you know, absolute clean bill of health, then they might just have a win and say, look, I, I might be able to get through this one. And it goes back to probably the, the quote Klopp said about Daniel Sturridge a few years ago. You know, we need to realise what's the difference between real pain and, and just a little bit of pain that you can shrug off and, and crack on with. I mean... Maybe that's a little bit unfair on Cater, but um, <clears throat> this wasn't a muscle injury or a, wasn't a hamstring or a calf or a, a knee or groin anything. He just kicked the floor and it's keeping him out of the game four days later, five days later. So um, how much does he want it? Because, you, you know, you'd imagine with Thiago and, and Elliot both out, he, he's got half a shot of starting tomorrow at Brentford. So um, disappointing, but um, it's nothing new in the, the Naby Cater story. Um, hopefully he's fit for Porto on Tuesday night. Yeah, Jurgen Klopp, I think you could see on his face, was a little bit frustrated with the situation. And I suppose it then opens up, Theo, and to be honest, I'm surprised that it's taken this long in the season, but it opens up that Gini Wijnaldum question again of availability. Three midfielders now out for Liverpool. Obviously, Wijnaldum never picked up an injury. It's, it's an obvious comparison to make, isn't it? It is, but there are still bodies there. Like I, I tweeted, I think, um, the story saying, oh, the two players are out. Um, you could be, well, you're going to be out without at least one of them for the Man City game. And it feels like it's depleted options. And I think the first response to me was, what you want about? They've still got another five midfielders that are available. And you could still throw Trent in there or do a 4-2-3-1 with uh, Firmino as a number 10 or even Minamino. Like Liverpool do still have bodies, but a number of these players are prone to picking up the odd knock and missing games. And it's one where they need to get rid of these tags and show, have that consistent run of form, have consistent run of fitness. Because you can put the same accusation, I suppose, against the Jordan Henderson, uh, Fabinho's missed games in the past. It's like Genie Wijnaldum was the only one that seemed to play every game, no matter what. But then that happens in a squad. Players do play through the pain barrier sometimes, but sometimes you do need to take them out. And it could be with Cater that Liverpool just don't want to take any risks because they've still got five very good options there that can fill these midfield places. Like James Milner's not put a foot wrong when we've seen him so far this season. And Curtis Jones, he's probably been rather hard done by the fact that he had a good season last year 
And in preseason, he basically went to the very end of the pecking order and he's had to fight his way back up. Now, injuries happen. It gives players opportunities. It's always frustrating when you see the same names getting knocks again and again, like a, a Cater or if it happens to an Oxide Chamberlain, for example. But it does present opportunities to other players and you just need them to take it. Uh, if you had signed another player, who's to say that they wouldn't have suffered a knock and then it goes through this? It's one where you can say Liverpool needed a midfielder, but they have the bodies there. It's just whether they can stay injury free and you can say that about any squad in any club across the globe if you've got the bodies there you don't necessarily need to sign it's it's just one of those where injuries can undo it all Uh, we saw that at centre-back last year the only blessing is when Liverpool lost all the centre-backs last year they had one man standing they've lost three central midfielders so far and they've still got five that can do a very good job for them who do you think is going to benefit most, Gorsty, in terms of these injuries? Is it going to be a case of, of Curtis Jones coming in? We mentioned Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain and, and James Milner before, but I don't know. It's It, it sort of seems like Curtis Jones's time to me. Yeah, I think so. Um, I thought he was very good the other night in almost the number six role, wasn't he? You looked at that midfield three, Curtis Jones, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain and Naby Keita, and you think, well, it's exciting. You know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see this unfold, but there's not much screening going on there for the back four. Um, and Jones did that very well. Um, you know, there was one teammate of his who was privately gushing about how well Jones did on Tuesday night, um, stepping into the void that he's, he's never played professionally as far as I'm aware. You know, a, a defensive midfield role that's completely alien to him uh, and his attacking instincts playing as a almost a um, number 10 possibly, if you like, or, you know, on on the, the left of a front three and he adapted to that so well. So um, I think um, if Klopp's given the opportunity of picking between Oxley chamberlain and Jones for that third midfield spot for the next two or three games, I think Jones probably is is winning that race quite comfortably at the moment. I suppose the, the added complication, Theo, is that there are three games in a week. You can't pick Jones, Henderson and Fabinho for each of them. There is going to be an opportunity. And as we said before, it, it might be a case of a couple of changes in each of those games, giving opportunities to these players that maybe they couldn't have, have seen a couple of weeks back. Yeah, very much so. And it's one where you look at the players, what games do they seem most suited for? Like you'd happily see Curtis Jones play against Brentford, but then you think a tough European game or Man City... Well, Oxley chamberlain has got form against Man City. James Milner, it's his former club. They could both do a job there, depending on if Klopp wants to properly attack City or if he wants that more conservative approach, that bit more experience with Milner. And then they've both got the European experience as well. It could easily be, if you're keeping Henderson and Fabinho fit, that you try and get them to do the three, knowing they've got the international break. And then it's the others that you can give those rest to. But then on the other side of that, Henderson's going to get called up by England. Uh, the Brazil situation's still a bit iffy, shall we say. But Milner's retired from international football. And Oxley chamberlain he's probably nowhere near the England squad at the moment. Curtis Jones might be in the 21s. So those two are players that you could turn to a bit more. It just depends what Jurgen Klopp feels is his strongest midfield for each of these games. It's not necessarily going to be the three biggest names, the three best names. It's just going to be what can do a job on what you're up against. Yeah, on the, a more positive front, Ghosty, there are some players returning. James Milner is one of those. Trent, Nico Williams and, and Roberto Firmino as well. And Jurgen Klopp made some comments about having three new players to pick from Van Dijk, Matip and Gomez. I'm sure that would have annoyed a few people, particularly on Twitter, but it is a correct statement to make nonetheless. Um, yeah, if you're judging across last season, then yeah, essentially... I think Mata played the most out of those three last season. He only made nine Premier League appearances, I think. Um, I'll have to double check that one, but certainly it wasn't double figures. Um, obviously, Van Dijk got injured less than a month into the new season when you think of the international break coming early in, in that season, which began in September. Gomez lasted until the November, and then he was out for 10 months. So it's um, it's a completely different kettle of fish to the one Jürgen Klopp was used to last season. Last year, it was basically last men standing, you know, put your boots on, you're playing centre-back, and, and whoever that those two were, whoever it happened to be, was just going to have to deal with it. So whether it was Henderson and Fabinho or Reese Williams and Nat Phillips and Billy Cometio came off the bench at one point, didn't he, in, in the Champions League. Now Klopp knows he's got four fit senior centre-backs who are all 
top class. Um, we know Virgil van Dijk is probably the best in the world. Joel Mata seems to be getting a little bit more appreciation from the wider football and fraternity this season. Um, he, he's he's one of the best in the Premier League for me. Joe Gomez. Um, he's had a he's had a terrible time with injury, hasn't he? Across the course of his career, he's still only 23, 24. So he, he's another top class one. And, and from what we've seen of Canate so far, he looks like he, he's going to be you know superb for you know. The, He's going to be spending his prime careers, prime years of his career as a Liverpool centre back. So, I think, um, I think if, if you look at it across the, well, was it six years that Klopp's been at Liverpool now? I think this is the strongest centre back contingent that he's ever had. Um, obviously, when he first joined, there was, there was loads of personnel in terms of Colo Torre, Martin Skirtle, um Mamadou Sacco, but. Um, there were injuries then, which forced them into the market for Stephen Corker, and obviously last season we know what happened there. So um, yeah, I, I think Liverpool have got the best kind of quartet of, of centre backs in the Premier League, and I, I don't mean that in terms of the four best centre backs in the Premier League all play for Liverpool. I just mean in terms of the selection that a manager can choose from. I think uh, Liverpool are able to boast the strongest. Yeah, it's certainly a, a very, very strong point in their squad. It'll be interesting to see which two line up in each of the next three games. I think that might tell us a little bit more about what Jurgen Klopp is thinking long term, but we will come to that very shortly. We are going to preview Brentford in a couple of minutes as well. But just whilst we've been recording this podcast, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's press conference has been going on and there's some interesting comments. A thinly veiled dig, Theo, at Jurgen Klopp. He says, there was a certain manager, Solskjaer says, who was worried about us getting penalties last year. The decisions since possibly have had a big difference on that. He seems to be suggesting that Jurgen Klopp has, has denied Manchester United some penalty kicks there. What do you make of that? Um, is he not aware of the VAR changes? That's the first thing that comes to mind. If they're not using VAR as much and they want to let the game flow a bit more and they're not blowing up for every single thing and having a look at every single thing, of course, there's going to be less penalties. But then he's just pointing the finger, isn't he? He knows it's going to go down well with his fans to have a little go at Jurgen Klopp. And it's one where I'd imagine he's under a little bit of pressure. Lost to young boys, didn't they, in the Champions League? Uh, knocked out of the Carabao Cup in midweek. They're fortunate to get the win against West Ham last weekend. It's like you've just signed Cristiano Ronaldo and you're not in. You're not storming ahead at the top of this Premier League, which you'd imagine a number of their fans are expecting. Uh, it, do we call it mind games? Is it too early for the mind games? Like it's all very well saying Klopp has cost you uh, penalties, but when a manager comes out and says this, it's very much hoping to put that seed into the referee's mind to think, oh, maybe that should be a penalty and to try and counter against it. Um, but then United, we've always thought, oh, that's a soft penalty. That's a United penalty, shall we say. And they have got a number of players that can win them very well. And you'd imagine we'll still be able to win them very well, whether it's a uh, uh, Rashford when he's fit, Greenwood, Martial, uh, Sancho. Uh, I'm not going to label them divers or anything, but it's just the way the game is. Like Liverpool, you could say the exact same thing about whether when Salah goes down or when Mane goes down, though he tries to stay on his feet. It's just what you expect to happen when a manager's facing the pressure a little bit and he's not happy with decisions from officials. He's going to point the finger elsewhere. And Is it really a surprise to see Solskjaer pointing at Klopp? Not really. I think I mind think, games. Mind games is the word, isn't it, Gorsty? I'm not sure about mind games as such in terms of trying to get one over on Klopp. I just I think he's trying to redress the balance. Um, if what he believes is true and Klopp's words have basically planted the seed in referees' ears and, and made them think, oh, okay, well, we're not giving them any penalties. He's trying to kind of <clears throat> redress that, isn't he? But look, the, this this penalty business for Manchester United, it, it's um it's Solskjaer's primary attacking tactic. Let, let's have it right. You know, Manchester United got so many penalties last season and can't quite remember the numbers off the top of my head, but um, I watched a lot of them last season and they were getting pens left and right. And as Theo says, the, the laws have been tweaked slightly to reflect um, a little bit more of a, uh, well, let the game flow seems to be the directive, doesn't it? And that seems to be what, what is happening. United were getting very soft ones last season and it, it's a tactic. Um, Solskjaer will tell his players to, once you're in the box, if you feel anything, go down because you get a penalty. And it's it's clever to an extent, but it's also very kind of primitive in terms of a tactical approach. Um, but there's no doubt about it that, that this is what Solskjaer sets his team out to do, to go and 
I win a penalty if they can here or there, and, and it, it's worked for so long. And now, um, obviously, it didn't go their way against West Ham on, on Sunday. I think Ronaldo had three claims for a penalty and, and got none of them. Uh, maybe he's got a little bee in his bonnet over that. But, they uh, should have had one in midweek as well. One of the players got absolutely yeah. clobbered in the box, but no VAR in the League Cup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's 100% an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer tactic to go out and, and win as many penalties as possible. And if that's if that's how he feels is the, is his way to victory, then fair enough. But uh, yeah, I think he might be bemoaning a few of those this season because he seems to be a higher threshold for, for penalties. Yeah, I'm not sure who the referee is for their game. I think it's Aston Villa for them this weekend, but... A little bit of extra pressure on his shoulders, no doubt about that. But we'll move on to preview Brentford then. Of course, we heard from Jurgen Klopp earlier, as we said. And one thing we didn't mention when we spoke about the press conference was just how much of a fan Klopp clearly is of, of what Brentford do. He was mm-hmm. a big fan of them and a, a big fan of, of Thomas Frank as well. Yeah, I mean, I can understand it, to be fair. I mean, Brentford not typically one of the big spenders of the championship. Seem to have a very clear ethos of how they work, a long-term strategy on the... Verona Matthew Benham, um, the director of football, Rasmus Ankerson, has been there for five, six years now. He's, he's one of these celebrated sporting directors, and, and Thomas Frank is a very likeable, almost eccentric um, manager. So um, there quite a few similarities between Brentford and Liverpool's model, if we're being honest. Um, so I can understand why Klopp is a big, big fan of it. And he said that he's kind of reminds him of his time at Mainz, so he didn't have too much in the bank for transfers and you have to kind of box clever and be a bit smarter and that is, is Brentford's whole way of operating the the um, statistical approach the data analysis behind the scenes the mathematical models that they use because obviously Matthew Benham if you're not too aware of who he is he, he's made his money in, in betting and, and um, basically um, statistics if you like so um, that whole model seems to be working for them I was, I was disappointed for them actually in the summer of uh, last year when they, they got beat by Fulham in the playoff final. I just thought, we know Fulham, we, we've seen their story in the Premier League, Brentford to be fresh storyline, and and they probably deserved it on the on the balance of that game. I think maybe Joe Bryan caught the keeper out for the late winner from about 40 yards, and, and that can happen. Um, you know, you can analyse it to death, but stuff like that can happen to you. So I was, I was delighted when they beat uh, Swansea in the playoff final in May to... To bring them up and uh, looking forward to seeing what the uh, Brentford Community Stadium is all about tomorrow. Yeah, they've had a, a couple of decent results early on this season. And there's a, a familiar face, Theo, in Sergi Canyos. He played 10 minutes under Jurgen Klopp for Liverpool in 2016. One of our freelancers over on Liverpool.com did a piece last week suggesting that he might even be at the level now where he could have been a useful squad player for Liverpool. I'm not quite sure I'd go that far, but he's certainly done well over the last few years. Yeah, he has. Um, Time in the Championship, hasn't he? He's been able to show what he can do. And he's one of these players that I think there's a number of them in the Championship that if you get that move to the Premier League or you get a promotion to the Premier League, you can stake your claim. Like It might not be enough to be an elite player at a Champions League club, but there isn't too much of a difference there. It's like if you've got a bit of trickery or a bit of pace, you can make that step up. And with Brentford, as Gorsty says, the model is similar to Liverpool. that They do sign players based on these statistics as well. And that model is very much, uh, we'll get to the next level. And if this player outgrows us, we'll sell them for big money and then go and bring the next one in. Like You just need to look at the strikers they've had over the years, like Clayton Donaldson, Andre Gray, Neil Morpé, Ollie Watkins, now Ivan Tony. It's very much, we'll grow with these players. And if they outseed us, we'll then use it to reinvest and get to that next level ourselves. It's like, well, isn't that what Liverpool did with, I suppose, Philippe Coutinho to get to this level they are at now? Now, I'm not saying Brentford are three or four big money sales away from uh, pushing for the Champions League, but the fact that they're playing football the right way, they're sticking with that style, they're sticking with their formation, and they're giving opportunities to the players that pretty much got them up. Like, it would have been easy to go out and spend big and properly reinvest in this squad and be ready for the Premier League and make that gamble. But we're seeing them giving the opportunities to Tony up front, he looks suited to the Premier League, doesn't he? He's a big physical striker. I saw the Wolves game last week and they could not handle him. He was unlucky not to get a hat-trick with disallowed goals. I think he set up one as well. And he's got a bit of everything. I think Canos, we knew he had talent when he was at Liverpool. 
he only left because he wanted some game time elsewhere. I think he made the wrong move. He went to Norwich, didn't he, before going back to Brentford, having done well at Brentford on loan. And even at Liverpool, you wouldn't have thought of him as like this wing-back sort of role. But he's showing that he's got talent, he's versatile. And there's a, there are a few players throughout their squad that you've got a talent. They've been linked with big moves in the past, but they've made that step up with Brentford. I'm thinking of the goalkeeper, Raya. Um, Janssen is the centre-back, wasn't he? He was at Leeds and rather, it was, a, I think, eyebrow raised when he made the move to Brentford. But yeah, it's uh, been a long over the due them getting the opportunity in the Premier League. And it's good to see them in these early weeks of the season more than holding their own. They are a good side and, and Klopp is clearly a fan ghosty, but ultimately Liverpool have to, to win this one, not least because one of their title rivals in Manchester City or Chelsea is going to have slipped up in that lunchtime game between the two sides at, at Stamford Bridge tomorrow. Yeah, huge week uh, in terms of the title race, isn't it? Um, or a huge eight days. If you think if Chelsea beat City tomorrow lunchtime and then Liverpool do the business Saturday and then Liverpool beat City on the 3rd of October... Going into the international break in City and nine points behind Liverpool, which um, is um, a big gap, isn't it? Even at this early stage, I remember Liverpool winning in the November of, of 1920 and I think that possibly took the main points clear and from there you felt it was Liverpool's to lose and, OK, Chelsea might still be hanging around the top in, you know, by the time the next international break comes, but... If those results do transpire, then it's a long way back for City and you're possibly looking at it being coming down to a two or, or a three horse race, depending on how you view United. So yeah, even you know, this early stage it's, it's a massive week, but Liverpool have have got to go and get the results themselves, haven't they? It's um, it's a bit boring, it's a bit of a cliche, but um Liverpool are serious about regaining their title, they've got to go to Brentford and they've got to pick up three points. And um so far they're kind of doing things with Minimal fuss, scoring three, not conceding too many, and I'm moving on to the next one at the moment. So, um, yeah, Liverpool are in really, really good form. Um, probably as good as they've been for 18 months or so, I'd suggest. Um, <clears throat> unbeaten now in 15 across the back end of last season and this season. It's the, the best run across all four divisions. So, um, yeah, Liverpool are absolutely flying. So, um, let's go to a newly promoted team and get the job done will be the message, I'm sure. I'm sure Liverpool would deny that they had one eye on the uh, the lunchtime kick-off, Theo, but what is the best result, do you think? Does it matter? Is is there a, an ideal result in terms of, of that Chelsea City game for you? I don't know. It's one where I suppose you've been burnt by the last last season, but you've got your lesson from the season before as well. I think that works for City. Like We've seen City start the last two seasons slowly dropping points in these opening six games. In one year when Liverpool won the title, it was very much costly because Liverpool built that early advantage and then just didn't let it go. Uh, and then the next year, everyone was dropping points. Top spot was changing on a weekly basis and City were able to go strongly in the second half of the season. Um, if it's one where if City drop points, I wouldn't say you could write them out the title race, but it's all very well clawing it back when it's just one team storming ahead at the top that you need to get back in front of. When it's two, it's very different. With Chelsea, I suppose there is that fear now of they're confident. They've won the Champions League. They've got a good draw at Liverpool. If they can then go and beat City, and they're going to be at least, what, level on points, depending on what happens with goal difference, whether they're the top or not, by the end of the weekend, depending on what Liverpool do. It's one way. It's almost win-win for Liverpool. You can take advantages and positives out of every single result. Mm -hmm. If Chelsea win, then City, that is a big blow for them like it's going to be a big ask for them to get back ahead of Liverpool and Chelsea if it's a draw well Liverpool got that chance to leave that early marker take top spot and then when they face City themselves go into the October international break on a big positive going we are the side to beat and then well if City win that's a blow against Chelsea maybe that can knock their confidence and then Liverpool again can leave that marker they can get top spot and again go into the October international break on a high but you can't look at too much at these other teams. It has to be like 1920, where every time they drop points, it is a positive. But it's more about Liverpool picking up the points, getting the wins themselves and not having to rely on them, making sure that they are the ones trailing and having to play catch up and just making it too difficult for them to be able to catch up. Yeah, very much down to Liverpool to focus on themselves, get their own job done. And just before we conclude off the podcast, we will uh, pick our teams for the game. Alison Becker will be back in goal after Depu uh, after Queen Kelleher deputised for him midweek. 
for me, Gusty, the back four kind of picks itself with one eye on Manchester City and obviously Porto between then. I'd be going with Trenton Robertson and Matip and Van Dijk. Which four are, are you going to go for? Yeah, I think so. Um, I've seen quite a few. Um, well, I say quite a few. I've seen a couple of things since the Norwich game where people are starting to get a bit high on um, Costa Shimakas to the point where the question whether he might be better than Andy Robertson. And I just think, Hold your horses, you know, he's played a handful of games and he hasn't let anyone down, but there's a long way between that and being one of the absolute very best left backs in Europe. So yeah, I am I'm, I'm bringing Robertson back in. Trent's obviously fine again after missing last week with Zaha Itis, according to James Milner. So um Liverpool going strong with, with the back five at Brentford for me. Theo, are you in agreement? Which well, which five I was gonna say, which four is it for you uh, across the back line? Oh, this four, if they're all fit, is going to be the four that starts against Man City. So the question is, how much do you want to play them this week with that Porto game? Like, If you go for the four of them against Brentford, you're going to probably vary up at least one of them against Porto in midweek because it's a big ask, I suppose, at this stage to keep having Van Dijk or Matic playing three fixtures in a, game, uh, in a week. Um, so it might be one where he wants to give one of the centre-backs the night off. Then They have just had the night off themselves. So rather than overthinking it, I'll, I'll stick with the, the traditional ones, as we're saying for now. But I wouldn't be surprised if one of Van Dijk or Matip did drop out with one eye on Porto and then one eye on City. We'll move on to the midfield then. For me, Gorsty, it's Fabinho Henderson and one more. The one more for me is going to be Curtis Jones. But there are one or two other options, as we mentioned before. Yeah, there are. As Theo mentioned, there are still loads of midfield options despite the injuries that they've picked up there already. Um, for being the old Henderson, and I'm going to go Curtis Jones. Theo, who are you going to go with? Yeah, Curtis Jones. I think it's the sort of game that you can really thrive in. Um, we saw him in that number six role in midweek. You'd like to see him be a bit more offensive in this one. Uh, hopefully he can stake a claim and show that he isn't this forgotten man in the Liverpool midfield. And the front line as well, Gorsley, is fairly straightforward for me. I think Diogo Jota does need a, a bit of a rest, but obviously there's a bit of a question mark over how fit Roberto Firmino is. I think it'll be Salah and Mane. I'm going to go with Jota for this one and bring Firmino off the bench. What are you going to go for? Yeah, that, that seems to be the the one that's leading the way at the moment, isn't it? But um, I think I think you could play either or Origi or Minamino for this one as well, um, with Salah Mane in there. Maybe Origi down the middle. I'm going to go with. Interesting, Theo. Who are you going to go for? I fancy going for Minamino. Like he got his couple of goals in um, in midweek, and he's looking sharp. He's not had many opportunities this season. He had a good pre-season. Um, like Jones, I feel like it's the sort of game he could do well in. Um, Diogo Jota hasn't had the best couple of games recently. He's looked a bit tired. He's missed a couple of good chances. Um, let him sit this one out and then give him a start against Porto. It's back in his homeland. Do you think that's the sort of game he could do well in? And then it's whoever plays well, like you have Roberto Firmino, back to full fitness. Hopefully by then, it's, then it's grab your shirt for the City game. Whoever plays well in these two can stake that claim to be alongside Salah and Mane. But yeah, Minamino deserves a go in the Premier League. Um, we've seen a bit more of Origi this season, so let's see what Minamino can do. Yeah, I'm sure if Roberto Firmino doesn't start, we'll probably see him off the bench at some point after his injury. But just before we go, we'll do our usual match predictions. I'm going to go for a 3-1 Liverpool win. I think Mohamed Salah will be on the scoreline once again. Gorsty, how do you reckon it might play out? I don't I don't see them conceding, to be honest. I just think that the way they're defending now is a unit... And if, if you do pick that first choice back five, then I, I can't see Brentford breaking through, even with um, Tony in a bit of form. So, um, yeah, I'll go 2 0. Theo, clean sheet or, or no clean sheet? Yeah, I think I can go along with a 2 0 as well. It's one where if um, Matip and Van Dyke can keep a, a Lukaku quiet, it doesn't matter how in form Ivan Tony is like to think they can do the same. Obviously, they're going to have a big boost for Brentford. It's a big day for them playing against Liverpool and for Tony testing himself against the best centre-back in the world. But Liverpool looks so good defensively at the moment. Even when they have to make all those changes and have the odd slip up, they're still keeping the clean sheet. So you'd like to think they have enough to get another clean sheet and get what will come the final whistle should be a final uh, comfortable win, even if it doesn't feel like that during the 90 minutes. 
Yeah, I'm sure it'll be a, a frantic game under the lights on Saturday evening. We'll have all of the reaction to the Brentford match across the Liverpool Echo. Liverpool.com and the Blood Red channel will be reacting to that as well as building up to the Champions League clash with FC Porto on Monday's edition of the podcast. For now, though, from myself, Matt Addison, Paul Gorst and Theo Squires, it's goodbye for now. This is the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo.